Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come, Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to be talking about 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as Jude. So what's going on here, Bryce? Let's talk about what you think is happening here and why it matters. All right. So in order to really understand these epistles, we need to go back to John's gospel. I remind you that John wrote approximately 21 chapters from premortal life to the end of his life. Now, of those 21 chapters, five of them are from the Last Supper, 13, 14, 15, 16, and then if we include the intercessory prayer that he gave in 17, that's five of 21 chapters in one night, and it really wasn't even the Atonement, Gethsemane, it was just the Last Supper. So John clearly saw something in that final meeting with the Savior that really promoted a lot of thought and resulted in almost one-fourth of his gospel being dedicated to the Last Supper. And there's a lot here. There's a lot. Jesus covers a lot of messages in the Last Supper, but there seems to be one main theme, and that was the two great loves. And they're tied to the two great commandments. So Jesus basically will say, if you love me, keep my commandments. So he talks about abiding in him like I am the vine. The other great love is if you love God, you will love those he loves. You will love his children and you will serve them. So Jesus starts the Last Supper by grabbing a bowl and girding himself and washing the disciples' feet and says, this is the great love. You know, those wonderful phrases all throughout the Last Supper where he says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Or then in chapter 13, he says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. And then by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Not because you're great scriptorians, not because you dress up and go to church. Men will know that you're my disciple because you love people. This seems to have been such a profound message that not only does John dedicate one-fourth of his gospel to that Last Supper, but that theme permeates through his epistles. So, for example, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness, there's the one love, is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother, there's the second love. Love of God is manifest in keeping his commandments, and love of others is manifest in service. You'll find it again at the end of that chapter, chapter 3, 1 John 3, 23 and 24. This is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Verse 24, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And so you're going to find this all throughout this. At the, you know, 1 John chapter 4 talks about if you say you love God and you hate your brother, you're a liar. You're doing it wrong. Because how can you love someone that you don't see and hate someone that you do see? And so major theme throughout this whole these epistles is that we ought to love man and love God. And then the other thing I've thought a lot about, Mike, is you remember when Jesus comes to 3rd Nephi and to the Americas and he says, what manner of man ought ye to be? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then he answers the question, even as I am. Notice it's not do. We Latter-day Saints often turn that into do. I need to do the things that the Savior did. And there's, I think that's great. I think that's how we become. But the question isn't what we should do. The question is what should we be? And it seems to me to connect all those dots that John caught the vision of who this man Jesus is. Who he is. Not what he does, who he is, what motivates him. And what motivates him is he loves his father and wants to keep his commandments. And he loves whom the father loves. He loves 
man, he loves us. I think John talks more about that than any of the other guys. Anyone else, writers. he seems to have caught that. Yeah. So if you want to be like the Savior, in answer to that question, what manner of man ought you to be? And we always say, I'm trying to be like Jesus. And what John seems to be teaching is what that means is you need to love God to the point where you are committed to keep his commandments. And you need to love others. Not because it's what we do, it's because of what we are. I am motivated by love for men, and that's who I am. I don't get jealous. I don't turn and get revenge. It's a hard thing. It's I, a hard I thing to do. I think as mortals, we compare ourselves. We see our inconsistencies. We, see, we have jealousies. We have all these weaknesses. And so how do we do that? That's a hard thing to do. But I just if we just put this out there, that what manner of men ought we to be, he seems to be saying, and John seems to be saying, it will manifest itself in two things that you want to keep Heavenly Father's commandments. That's at the very heart of your soul. And number two, you want to bless other people. So the question is how we do that. And now I would turn to you know Moroni chapter 7. If charity is the title of being like Christ, charity is the pure love of Christ. And that verse 48, Moroni 7, 48, how do you gain charity? Two things. You ask for it. You want it. You desire it. When it becomes what we desire and what we pray for and what we're asking for, it becomes a gift that God gives us. And then secondly, he says, upon whom does he bestow charity? It says, upon those who are true followers of the Son, Jesus Christ. So this is where the do comes in. By doing the things that Jesus did, I am manifesting my desire to be like him. And to say to Heavenly Father, I want the blessing. I want you to bless me with charity. One of my favorite descriptions of celestial people in Doctrine and Covenant 76 is that they are just men made perfect through the atonement. It's the desire to be like him. I want to love like he loves. I want to serve like he serves. I want other people to be as important to me as they were to him. That, to me, is the essence of John. That John seems to have caught that vision that is about being like Christ, and Christ was all about obeying his Father's commandments and serving and loving other people. Seeing them as he sees them. Yeah. And I think that it is a gift. It's one of those things where uh, you have to ask for it, and it is a gift. I've had experiences where people bug me, or maybe, I, you know, we all do, or we have difficulties, and... Sometimes we pray for God to change them, and I've, I've learned that, for me, those prayers fail. If I pray for, dear Heavenly Father, please help so-and-so to change so that my life is easier, those prayers don't work. But if I ask for my heart to change, then I think that's where miracles happen. Especially when we ask, help me love them the way thou, Father, dost love them. Help me see them the way you see them. That's good. How many care about them the way you care about them? If it all comes back to heart and soul, then it's a matter of, I want to be a person that sees their value. I want to see them as God sees them. And that is what we pray for. You know, this is, to me, this is why we, we read scripture. We want to read it and find a way that we can apply it, that we can have it have meaning in our life. Yeah. And these chapters all teach that. They, they have different ways that they say it, but essentially that is at the root of Christianity is how we treat each other. I, I like to call it a golden thread that's woven through the text of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. I like how you tied it in with the Last Supper where Jesus talks the talk, but he's always doing it. That's right. So that's brilliant. That's he starts incredible. the Last Supper by manifesting what he's about to teach. And he yeah. just, he washes their feet. This is in uh, 1st John chapter 4, verse 10. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. There's the pattern. And if God loved us, then we ought to love one another. But it starts with, with it his It starts love. with his love for us. And if you catch that vision, that there's the standard. The standard is God's love for me. And I need to elevate my love for him and my love for everyone else as high as I possibly can to match his love for me. And that when I look at people, I ought to do my very best to see them as he sees them. Because he started it. He was the one that loved first. And that God is love. 
All right, Mike, that's some great thoughts about love, but I know you've got some great insights into the text itself and John, and why don't you geek out for a second? So we don't know who wrote it. Uh, it, it certainly has a lot of the flavor of the Gospel of John in tradition, in in Christian history. Uh, one of them is a bishop. His name is Papias. says that there's two Johns. You have John, the apostle, and then there's a John called John the Elder, and that may, maybe he wrote this. I'm okay with whoever wrote it, but uh, it says that it's addressed uh, from John the Elder. But the story of John, there, there's a lot of stories that circulated around early Christianity, early, early Christian history. And Ephesus is this, uh, it's a city in Asia Minor where John was supposedly the bishop. And he's the only apostle that our Christian historians say wasn't martyred. There's one story of uh, him being uh, bound up and put in a vat of boiling oil, and he was untouched. And as a Latter-day Saint, I read that, and I'm like, hey, that sounds kind of like 3 Nephi 28. It sounds like Section 7 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Those are really good texts that talk about this idea that John doesn't die. Uh, But one of the stories about John that I really like, and like I said, it's apocryphal, and it comes from um, Irenaeus in Against Heresies, is a story where John finds this young man. And this young man uh, is a, just a healthy, strapping young male, and John converts him to Christianity. And the young man goes off the path, and he strays, and he struggles, and he gets hooked up with a bunch of uh, ruffians and becomes a, a bandit, kind of a robber. And time passes, and he's older, and he's kind of cemented in his ways. And it actually says... Uh, Irenaeus writes, he says, he became a bold bandit chief, the most violent, most bloody, most cruel of them all. Time passed and some necessity having arisen, they sent for John. They're thinking, well, we can't help this guy. We're going to go get John. So John comes to find him. And when he goes and he looks for him, someone says, he is dead to God. Uh, Meaning that this young man is just, he's a lost cause. He turned wicked and abandoned. And at last he's a robber. And to John, He says, you know, he may be dead to you, but he's not dead to me. And so he goes and finds him. And he finally finds this young man. And it says, uh, he has to chase him because the kid runs away. And it says, John, forgetting his age, pursued him with all his might, crying out, why, my son, dost thou flee from me? Thine own father, unarmed, aged, pity me, my son. Fear not, thou hast still hope of life. I will give account to Christ for thee. If need be, I will willingly endure thy death as the Lord suffered death for us. For thee, I will give up my life. Stand, believe, Christ has sent me. And that's, a, that's just a beautiful story about John. And John rescues this kid and brings him back. And I just love that. And there's a couple of reasons why I love it. One of the reasons is it typifies everything that you just said about how that's what John's trying to teach. He personifies his own teaching. It's beautiful. He learns to see people the way Jesus sees them. I love it. And he runs to, it's the very definition of sucker, to run to. And he becomes like the master he has learned to love. I love that story. And I want to talk a little bit about another thread in these texts. And it's the thread of he lost his way. And I believe that 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John are talking about Christians are losing their way. He uses the phrase antichrist quite a bit. Quite a bit in here. Which yeah. is not a person as much as it's a theol. You know, it's, it's an opposing idea. Yeah. It's an opposing theocracy. It's a false ideas. It's not so much the threat of an individual person as much as it's the threat of false ideas. And so he talks a lot about don't be deceived or uses the word seduced. Yeah. Don't be seduced by false ideas that will lead you away from Christ. So a couple of his teachings, if you look in verse 7 of chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Can I throw something yeah, in, Mike? Go Just ahead. a side note. Yeah. That was the last recorded statement from Bruce R. McConkie. If yeah. you look at Elder McConkie's final address, The Purifying Power of Gethsemane, he ends it by quoting that very verse. Awesome. May we walk in the light as God our Father is in the light, so that the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, will cleanse us from all sin. And then Elder McConkie was done, and he died a few days later. Significant that his final verse was a verse from John. That's good. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean no, to interrupt you, I, love but I just it. loved that. I love it. Okay, go to chapter 2, 
verse 22. Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoso denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. 18. I'm just reading the middle of the verse. Uh, You've heard that antichrist shall come even now. Are there many antichrists? Okay, so that seems to be something that is being addressed. And then one more, it's chapter four, yeah. Before you leave that, in verse 19, he points out, they went out from us, yes, but were not of us. That's important. So one of the biggest threats are those who walk away from the faith and then try to destroy it. Yes. Yeah, and, and I will say, I think that there's many different ways to read verse 19, and one way is that, and another way to read it is, they have the trappings of Christianity, but they're not orthodox. And I really think that all these different Christianities, they're struggling to decide who is Jesus. And to me, if I lived at this time, it would be, I would listen to the apostles because they're the living witnesses. And then as time passes, the next group of people are called the apostolic fathers. These are the people that knew the apostles. So one of them is a guy named Polycarp, and he's going to talk a lot about John because he was associated with John. Many of us have teachers that influenced us, and they kind of help us on our way. Well, Polycarp, he was John's guy. He loved John. Uh, Go to 1 John 4, verse 3. This is important. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus is come in the flesh is of God. But... Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of the Antichrist. What's going on? So, uh, you know, I say this all the time. All this is in the show notes, so we're keeping it simple. But essentially, there were lots of Christianities floating around during this time. And to make it really simple, you could draw a line on a board if you were teaching this in a class. And on one side of the board are people that see Jesus as fully God, fully divine. And on the left of the line, imagine people seeing Jesus as fully man, fully mortal. And these phrases, these terms I'm going to throw at you are not common terms that we use in Latter-day Saint vernacular, but it is in the scholarship. And so in the scholarship, on the left-hand side of the line, people that see Jesus as fully man are going to be called adoptionists. And what that means is they believe that the, the Spirit of God adopted Jesus. Jesus became a son of God through his righteousness or through his adherence to the law. And many of these adoptionists believed that Jesus became divine at his baptism. When God said, this is my beloved son, hear him. Now we've talked about this before, but it, and it's a lot to unpack, but that's quoting Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. Kings in the ancient world and I'm, I'm using air quotes here, Bryce, they became sons of God. And what I mean by that is they became God's voice on earth, a son of God. And, and this was happening all throughout the ancient world, even as happening in Rome. And so some of these Christians looked at Jesus as Messiah, anointed one, but he was born of Joseph and Mary. There is no divinity in his parentage. And to John, that's going to be offensive. John's going to say that's not right. On the right-hand side of the, of the line are those that see him as fully divine. And these people are going to generally be called docetists. And a real famous one is Serenthus. And Serenthus is a guy that would, he, if he was in this room, he would say, Jesus was so divine, if he walked in the snow, he wouldn't leave footprints. Jesus appeared to die on the cross, but he didn't, because um, that can't happen. And some of their artwork portrays Jesus as, as a baby going down the road and the trees are bowing down to him and all this time of this mythology that he was just, he was a God here among us. Yes. And they really wanted to pay homage to him. And they, they said things like, uh, Jesus uh, certainly didn't suffer. He only seemed to suffer. That's where the, where the word docetist comes from. It comes from Dokio, a famous... Uh, Docetus later after John's time was a man by the name of Marcion. And Marcion basically said that Jesus couldn't have taken flesh. And this is kind of a vulgar statement that Marcion made, but I'm going to repeat it because it really bears hearing. He said essentially that if Jesus uh, was flesh, if he took upon him flesh, then he would be a bag filled with excrement. 
And that was their view, that Jesus didn't sweat, he didn't bleed, he didn't go through these, he's just so divine. And to John, both of these approaches to Jesus, they're called Christologies, how they approach the understanding Jesus were offensive. And so he doesn't like this. He doesn't uh, appreciate it, and so he uses really bold terms. Some of the adoptionists are called Ebionites, and these are Jewish Christians that rejected the virgin birth of Jesus. They held that he was the natural son of Joseph and Mary, and they believed Jesus became the Messiah because he obeyed the Jewish law. They loved the gospel of Matthew. And so these Ebionites, like I said, they were adoptionists. They had a low view of Jesus, a low Christology. And the Docetists had a very high view of him, that he was so divine he didn't suffer. Anyway, all of that's happening. And so in this time period, whoever wrote John, we're going to say John, he's refuting these teachings by bearing witness of who Jesus is. And so in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, at the very beginning, he says that. In those two verses, he says, we've seen, we've manifested, we bear witness. What are we bearing witness of? Verse 7, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Uh, If you go to uh, chapter 2, verse 22 and 23, we've read those, but there he's saying, don't deny the Father and the Son. And then you go to 1 John 4, 1 through 3, and he's saying, we've got to confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That's chapter 4, verse 2 of 1 John. And if you don't confess that, then you're not of God. Well, what is that going against? What is that teaching going against? It's going against Uh, the position of the Docetist, that he didn't have flesh. And then this one's really important. And this, to me, this verse really makes sense if we read it, understanding the historical situation happening. So we're reading 1 John 5, verse 6, and it says this, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. I think a good historical reading of that verse is this. John saying, he didn't become the Christ when he was baptized. That wasn't what made him Jesus. That wasn't what made him divine. What made him divine was he came from the heavens. So in verse 6, it says, he came by water and blood, even Jesus, meaning he was born divine. He was born of a virgin. And then he says this in verse 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now there's lots of ways to read this, but one way to read it is that John is testifying that Jesus is both of the heavens and of the earth, that he's human and he's divine. And he's trying to bring the Christians along into orthodoxy, trying to teach them who Jesus is. And Bryce, it takes centuries for Christians to work this out. But we see this fight happening right here in the first century. Yeah. And you remember Jesus was kind of setting them up for that. And John, going back to his gospel, is going to include the Savior saying, for this reason I came into this earth, that I might lay my life down. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. He's teaching. And John, I think looking back, is saying, wait a minute, Jesus taught us that, that he was both divine and human, that he had power to lay his life down, hence his human side, and he had power to lift it up again, hence his divine side. John seems to be remembering that Jesus tried to teach this. He tried to clarify this, that he was the Son of God, but he was also the Son of Mary, which allowed him to be human, but divine at the same time. So maybe an application to this, I don't think Latter-day Saints struggle with this, with understanding this. We have the Book of Mormon, but I think that maybe, you know, we're back to Timothy, Timothy, and Titus again. There are other issues that Latter-day Saints struggle with, and I think a great reading of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John is, listen to the apostles. If you listen to the apostles, they're going to point you in the way of life and salvation, and whatever issues are swirling around in your day, I think their voice matters. And John's clarifying an issue that they have because they're swimming in Greek philosophy and why would God have matter? And there are all these ideas swirling around that really aren't relevant to us today. But the overarching issue, I think, Bryce, that is relevant is, are we listening to the apostles? In the Book of Mormon, we have the tree of life, and then we have the opposite of the tree of life, which is the building. It's the fake tree. It's the imitation. And the scriptures carry that theme throughout that, that we're, don't be fooled by an imitation. 
And the way you make sure you're not fooled by the imitation in the tree of life is you hold on to the rod and you hold on to the words of God. You heard, you hold on to words of prophets, seers, and revelators, the words of the Holy Ghost inside you. You listen to the clarifying doctrine that comes from prophets, seers, and revelators. And as you hold to it, you won't be deceived by an imitation. Yeah. I think that's a great summary of John that he was an apostle and he is declaring doctrine. And if we hold to his doctrine, we won't be led astray. Yeah. So on that note, let's do Jude. I think Jude's kind of saying that same thing. Yep. Jude is kind of justifying why Heavenly Father in times past have had to destroy people. Here's what they did and here's why they were destroyed. And so it's kind of an example of what not to do. Yeah. And one of my favorite references in all of Scripture is the, the primordial spirits that followed Satan. Um, we kind of give the impression that they were kicked out. They were cast out. But Jude paints a very different picture. Verse 6. Verse 6, the angels which kept not their first estate, but they left, left yeah. their own habitation. That's a good reading. They left. They stormed out. And then there's a, some, there's a fascinating application to that, meaning we made no room for them. And so if you turn to Nephi, Nephi's prophecy of the latter days is that the, you know, Satan will be bound during the millennium because we will make no room for him. He won't find a place to dwell. And so they stormed out because they weren't comfortable there. They didn't want to be there. And so they left. It's not so much that God kicked them out, but we all kicked them out by not wanting them to have an influence in our hearts. And in the, you know, Nephi says there's a prophecy of the latter days that in the millennium, Satan will be bound, not because we forced him into outer darkness, but because there won't be room for him in our hearts. And yet he leaves, but he never leaves us alone. Yeah. Which I find ironic. Yep. Right. If I'm kicked out of some, if the country club kicks me out, I'll go golf somewhere else. But Satan is just, he I is can't just, leave it alone. He's not done. Yeah. Yeah, but that is the sign of how we overcome Satan. We cast him out by not giving him room. I'm not going to allow him room in my heart, in my thoughts. I'm not going to give him room, and that gives me power over him. And that's when he leaves, because I have taken him out. By the way, I think what's really relevant with Jude, it's, it's pretty caustic stuff. Uh, we're talking about Korah. Jude gives Balaam a bad rap. We're not going to do it in the podcast, but I show both sides. Balaam is presented good and bad in the Old Testament. It's complicated. It's in the show notes. Check it out. But uh, a lot of Jude and a lot of Peter. Either Jude's quoting Peter or Peter's quoting Jude. But a lot of the stuff we did with Peter is happening here. Once again, we're back to Enoch. And in the Enoch, and First Enoch, and I put in the show notes, six, First Enoch 6 and First Enoch 8, uh, these angels that fall swear by the throat to destroy God's work. These guys are angry and they're out to get us. And whoever wrote Jude is quoting this stuff. And I love it, Bryce. We were like, they left. They took their stuff and they're like, we're out of here. And then in the book of Jude, this author is referring to the people that are fighting against Christ in his day. Look what it says in verse 11. Woe unto them, meaning the people in his day, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam and perish in the gainsaying of Kor. That's number 16, Korah, when the earth swallowed him and his, and his ilk up. These are spots in your feasts of charity. That's a reference to the sacrament. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves. These are people that do a lot of talking and there's no nourishment. And I cannot tell you, Bryce, I see this today and I'm not going to get specific, but man, are there people out there and they're tearing down faith and they're giving you nothing. There's no nourishment. You just walk away emaciated and it's just, it's sad. It's just awful. So uh, to me, Jude is totally, totally applicable today. Yep. Especially in verse 14, where he actually quotes Enoch. So you can see he's quoting Enoch. Yeah. Yeah. Intense, intense stuff. So in conclusion, John says, be like Christ and Christ is love. Love is manifested two ways. If you love God, you'll keep his commandments and you'll serve those that he loves. You'll love your fellow men. 
Jude is, beware of the deception. Beware of the enemy. Beware of those who are trying to destroy you. So with that, we thank you for listening. Now, before we go, I just want to remind you that we've been working on some new video content on our YouTube channel that you might enjoy. These new videos are in addition to our podcasts and supplements to your Come Follow Me study. So we hope that you'll check them out on our YouTube channel called Talking Scripture. We'll leave a link in the description. And with that, make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.